You know, there were a lot of things about that book, Acts of God, that made it fascinating to me as a child. It was easy to read, for one thing. There was little diagrams about how tornadoes worked, and there was facts about earthquakes. I love earthquake facts. And there were so many old black and white photographs that for a nine-year-old were simply shocking. Like there was a picture of a tree through a house and a house that a tornado had dropped on another house. And there was pictures of women in big hoop skirts standing next to these 15-foot high snow drifts that a trolley had driven into and gotten stuck. Like I couldn't imagine. There was even a pile of houses that had all washed down river and just gotten stuck one after another by a bridge. It was very cool to me. But hands down, my favorite part of Acts of God was the first-hand stories of people who had lived through it all, the eyewitness accounts uh, of inundations, conflagrations, calamities, mortalities, inflamities, anything weird that could befall a cloud or a coastline, sure enough, there was someone in a hoop skirt who'd lived through it <laughs> and had written a letter to their sister back east that said, quote, I didn't know it then, but that was only the first day of the great mudslides. <laughs> and then third grade me would get a little chill and think, oh no, there's a second day. <laughs> or there would be a weather diary from a farmer in Oklahoma that would say, June 10th, the wind was unaccountably strong today. And then frogs fell. It was a most curious sight. And I'd think, oh my god, it's happening. <laughs> it was a different time then for me and them. But I hope the history buffs among you will understand that feeling. You know, that when history starts to feel really real to you, when the words of people who've been dead for a long time suddenly feel alive and present. It feels like you're opening up a kind of portal, but the portal is you. Like, as long as I had acts of God open, those memories were still real, they still mattered. It just seemed impossible to me that like a whole town could get wiped out by a flood and that no one could remember anymore. That that would be the most important event in those people's lives. And all I could do was open the book to make it real again. It seemed impossible that those stories were from so long ago. And it feels strangely privileged to be on the other side of history where I knew how it all turned out, because looking at the photographs, I knew they didn't know how it all was going to turn out, but it wound up in the book Acts of God, so we know where this is going. And so the book prompted in nine-year-old me a lot of philosophical reflection about the passing of time and the nature of knowledge and consciousness. I don't know what my parents thought I was doing with this book, but it was from the Old Farmer's Almanac, and I know it's not supposed to prompt existential crises in your children. <laughs> so a couple of years later, the blizzard of 96 hit South Jersey, where I grew up, and I thought, oh my god, it's happening! <laughs> it was great! We made an, three feet of snow fell in one day. School was closed all week. My sisters and I built an igloo in the front yard, and I was part of history. Yes! And for years after that, whenever a hurricane or a nor'easter would come up the Jersey coast, I would like watch out the window, waiting for the neighbor's house to fall down. <laughs> Not our house. Our house could stay. <laughs> right? <laughs> It's not a thing that happens in South Jersey, but we used to have a lot of power outages because there are so many trees and the wind blows them down. Uh, so whenever the lights would go out during a thunderstorm, I would secretly hope against hope that this would just be day one <laughs> of what would come to be called the Great Blackout. And then my grandkids could say, Grandma, you lived through the Great Blackout of 97? And I would say, it was a different time then. <laughs> or whatever a grown-up would say in retrospect in that situation. So now I understand uh, that there's a big difference between excitement and fear, and that difference is whether or not you're safe. <laughs> and evidently I thought that I was, and I was. But I think I wanted to have important memories of important events. I wanted to live through those things, but I wanted to live through them. I wanted to be safely on the other side of disaster and history, knowing how it all turned out in my favor. I wanted the memories of having lived through it all. And so if reading this book, Acts of God, made me feel like I was time traveling into the past, 
I started to imagine that growing up would be like time traveling into the future in slow motion, and that everything I was doing now would one day be part of the past. Not to alarm you, but speaking as someone who has successfully done this and is now in the future, that is exactly how it works. Yeah, we carry forward with us our memories and our stories from our younger selves. I find memory itself to be pretty weird, you know, when I think about it too hard. Unlike most animal species, we can just close our eyes and call into cognition that which is not real. We can bring up an incredible amount of information about places and things and people that do not exist in front of us at this point in time. We can recreate the sensation of being in the past. That's weird. If you've lost someone you love, you might know the feeling of missing them so hard and thinking about them so intently that it feels impossible that you can't just reach out and touch them. The memories feel so real, it makes no sense that the person is gone. And let me tell you, some years ago I had lost a family member and some well-intentioned person said to me, he's not really gone. You still have the memories. At that time, in the depth of my grief, that person is so lucky they were not within arm's reach of me. <laughs> but it was at least partially true. My family member is, in fact, gone. Uh, but I do still have the memories. And whether or not that's a consolation for loss, I really can't tell you. But I'm glad I have the memories. One of my favorite poems now as an adult is The Wanderer. It's from the year 975. It's so old. It's pretty short and boring, especially compared to Acts of God. But in the poem, a man just sits and thinks about all the loved ones he's lost, remembers the good times, and laments not having anyone to talk to about those days because no one else is left to remember it. And that really resonated with me. And I find it touching that someone in the year 900 thought it was important enough to write it down, and that in the year 2000-something, that still rings true in my heart. Now I'm at an age where a couple times a year, I hear that someone I used to know has died. And from what I understand, as you get older, uh, that pace only picks up. Every time I go through the same process of reminiscing and thinking back to the old days, sometimes it's a person I haven't talked to in a decade or longer. If you've heard the term disenfranchised grief, I think it's an important one uh, to know and remember. The idea is that there's some losses people tend to grieve in private because they're just not acknowledged by society. So when your spouse dies, people offer condolences, left and right. But what about when your ex-spouse dies? It still hurts. What about a parent you were estranged from and haven't talked to your friends about in many years? A same-sex partner in a closeted relationship. You tend to get made the roommate and left out of the family's decisions. A coworker or a longtime friend that you only knew online and didn't realize how much you relied on them every day. A friend from your youth that no one knew you were still friends with. A lover you had an affair with and didn't tell anybody. The loss of a child, not to death, but to adoption, even voluntary. The loss of a child to suicide or overdose, the things we don't talk about. The loss of family relationships, even of the living, because you yourself were on drugs or in prison. The loss of family relationships because you were ostracized for who you are. These are all examples of disenfranchised grief, and they are real. And in my work as a chaplain, I have seen the same thing over and over and over again. The surviving family member who was most estranged from the dying person is often the most stricken. But they leave the room to cry because they think they have no right to their grief and don't want to do it in front of the real relatives. And they don't sit around and share their stories of the dead person's life because they think they have no right to treasure their own memories, like those memories don't count as much. They do. I think our individual memories are sacred. I think they're precious and irreplaceable. And I think, in a theological sense, that each person's memory is but a fraction of the sacred, divine consciousness of the universe itself. And we each have a share, and it is not the same as anyone else's. At a funeral with 80 people, there are 80 separate memories of that person, and no one is more valid than any other. This is why it can be so healing just to have someone to tell your stories to, 
When someone experiences disenfranchised grief, they're left with these sacred memories that they can't share, but which are still just as vibrant and present and at the forefront of their minds. So sometimes I like to give you all a coffee hour assignment to talk about with each other. So we have those richer and deeper conversations, asking the kinds of questions that aren't normally polite to ask. And so today I'd like you, if you're so inclined, to find someone you haven't talked to much and ask them to share just one happy memory from their childhood, which I hope they have. In 1996, a blizzard hit South Jersey and my little sister and I built an igloo. Later, we would wind up estranged for over a decade. But on that day, we used sheets of ice that had hardened on top of the snow to put windows in the igloo, which was pretty genius for some little kids, I must say. And we did it working together, still friends, and the light inside was glowing almost blue. None of the adults saw it. That was just our memory together. It was a different time then. It always is. So I'd like to close with this passage from the Bhagavad Gita about Brahman, the ultimate reality of the universe. I am the self that dwells in the heart of every mortal creature. I am the beginning, the lifespan, and the end of it all. I am the radiant sun among the light givers. I am the mind. I am the consciousness in the living. I am death that snatches all. I am the source of all that shall be born. I am time without end. I am the sustainer. My face is everywhere. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end in creation. I am the knowledge of all things. I am glory, prosperity, beautiful speech, memory, intelligence, steadfastness, forgiveness. I am the divine seed of all lives. In this world, nothing animate or inanimate exists without me. I am the strength of the strong. I am the purity of the good. I am the knowledge of the knower. There is no limit to my divine manifestations. Whatever in this world is powerful, beautiful, or glorious, that you may know to have come forth from a fraction of my power and glory. Amen. Blessed be.